We are all evil in some form or another. There'd be none of you left. Lisa, huh? You're in trouble now. <laughs> yeah, right. Aren't you afraid sitting that close to me? You feel that everything will turn out all right, that you are innocent. Do you still feel that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, more than ever. I believe in the, in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world. And I acted on my fantasies, and uh, that's where everything went wrong. A uh, picture of my son. They would know I was a probably normal person. I'm okay. I'm okay. God is going to be there. Jesus Christ is going to be there. All the angels and everything. Mao Zedong wanted China to become a superpower, but how he went about it wasn't the best. Loss of life to Mao Zedong really wasn't of much importance to him, as long as the end goal was achieved. The BBC writes, Mao and other communist leaders set out to reshape Chinese society. Industry came under state ownership and China's farmers began to be organized into collectives. All opposition was ruthlessly suppressed. The Chinese initially received significant help from the Soviet Union, but relations soon began to cool. In 1958, in an attempt to introduce a more Chinese form of communism, Mao launched the Great Leap Forward. This aimed at mass mobilization of labor to improve agricultural and industrial production. The result, instead, was a massive decline in agricultural output which, together with poor harvests, led to famine and the death of millions. The policy was abandoned and Mao's position weakened. In an attempt to reassert his authority, Mao launched the Cultural Revolution in 1966, aiming to purge the country of impure elements and revive the revolutionary spirit. One and a half million people died and much of the country's cultural heritage was destroyed. In September 1967, with many cities on the verge of anarchy, Mao sent in the army to restore order. It was in this great leap forward that Mao's rule cost the lives of millions. He wanted to change China into an industrialized nation and implemented tons of unproven agricultural methods. This dropped the food output significantly and led to the Great Chinese Famine. This famine is largely regarded as the deadliest man-made disaster in human history, so yeah, it was pretty bad. Unlike others on this list, Mao for the most part wasn't infatuated with the deaths of citizens, it was just a byproduct of his incompetency and horrible rule. Granted, we can't let him off too easily because he also didn't care that much to change his way of thinking. During his reign of power, it's estimated that 40 to 70 million Chinese civilians died through forced labor, executions, or famine. Number 4 on this list is Nero. We're throwing it way back with this one and going to the year 37 AD. That's when Nero was born and he lived until 68 AD. Only just over 30 years of life, but he did enough during that time to earn himself a spot on this list. Wikipedia writes, Most Roman sources offer overwhelmingly negative assessments of his personality and reign. The historian Tacitus claims the Roman people thought him compulsive and corrupt. Suetonius tells that many Romans believe that the great fire of Rome was instigated by Nero to clear land for his planned golden house. Tacitus claims that Nero seized Christians as scapegoats for the fire and had them burned alive, seemingly motivated not by public justice but by personal cruelty. This personal cruelty of his is widely documented and nobody was safe from it. One would think that your own mother would be on the do not kill list, but apparently not for Nero. To rid himself of any potential outside influences, he had his own mother murdered. He said to have stabbed, burned, boiled, impaled people for his own personal pleasure. Couple this with the fact that he's said to have burned down entire cities while people are still inside of them, and you get a horrible tyrannical dictator who I'm sad to report actually did exist. Number 3 on this list is Pol Pot. Wikipedia writes, Pol Pot was a Cambodian revolutionary and politician who governed Cambodia as Prime Minister of Democratic Kapucha between 1976 and 1979. Ideologically a Marxist, Leninist and a Khmer nationalist, he was a leading member of Cambodia's communist movement, the Khmer Rouge, from 1963 until 1997 and served as the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Kampucha from 1963 to 1981. Under his administration, Cambodia was converted into a one-party communist state and went through the events of the Cambodian Genocide. 
The Cambodian genocide is something that we don't learn about enough in history class. This genocide claimed the lives of at least 1.5 million Cambodian civilians from 1975 to 1979. 1.5 million is already a ridiculously large number, but it should also be noted that in 1975, this would have accounted for roughly a quarter of the entire country. Pol Pot and the party that he led during this time wanted to turn Cambodia into an agrarian socialist republic. At the time, Mao Zedong was in charge of China and Pol Pot went to him for advice on how to make this a reality. To do this, he emptied out cities and forced people into labor camps where they were either executed or simply worked to death. Disease and malnutrition was also rampant in these camps and the quality of life was horrible. Money was abolished and everybody was forced to wear the exact same black clothing stripping people of any sense of their individuality. This truly was a horrible time in Cambodian history and saw so many atrocities committed countrywide. It finally ended when the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia in 1979 and Pol Pot's government fell. He lived for roughly another 20 years though, finally dying in 1998. Number two on this list is Joseph Stalin. Ekharsh Merota writes, Joseph Stalin was dictator of the Soviet Union from 1922 till his death in 1953. As a young man, he was a robber and an assassin. For almost 30 years, he reigned with terror and violence in the Soviet Union. His decisions led to a famine that killed millions. Forget enemies, he even killed families of people who were fond of him. Under his rule, more than 1.5 million German women were assaulted and in all, he easily killed over 20 million people. He once said, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. Ironically, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 1945 and 1948, and he died of a stroke in 1953. That famine that I just mentioned frankly does not get talked about nearly enough. Wikipedia writes, The Holodomor, also known as the Terror Famine or the Great Famine, was a famine in Soviet Ukraine from 1932 to 1933 that killed millions of Ukrainians. It was a large part of the wider Soviet famine of 1932-1933. The term Holodomor emphasizes the famine's man-made and allegedly intentional aspects such as rejection of outside aid, confiscation of all household foodstuffs, and restriction of population movement. As part of the wider Soviet famine of 1932-1933, which affected the major grain producing areas of the country, millions of inhabitants of Ukraine, the majority of whom were ethnic Ukrainians, died of starvation in a peacetime catastrophe unprecedented in the history of Ukraine. Since 2006, this has been recognized by Ukrainians and 15 other countries as a genocide of the Ukrainian people carried out by the Soviet government. This was a famine that could have been prevented or dealt with, but just wasn't. It was actually intentional. There are reports of survivors who said that soldiers would come to their homes and specifically destroy any food that they had there for no reason. Stalin truly was void of emotion, and it's sad that a man like this actually existed. Coming in at number five, Michael Taylor. It's 1974, Yorkshire, England. Michael Taylor, age 31, father of five and husband to Christine Taylor. Michael was a well-mannered and caring father and husband. Michael, like anyone, became depressed from a back injury, left him short on work and seeming a little odd and off. After seeking religious advice and a one-on-one -on -one session at a local church, Michael started having outbursts and acting aggressively. Puzzled, he seeked one-on-one -on -one sessions which turned ugly. After apparently changing form and attacking Marie, a young religious leader helping Taylor and unable to remember anything, Michael and the church agreed that an exorcism was necessary. Father Peter Vincent and Reverend Raymond Smith met at St. Thomas and started. It got so violent, he was tied to the church floor. After hours in the middle of the night, the two had managed to exorcise more than 40 demons out of Michael, in which appeared around them as they exited. Violence continued, leaving only three demons remaining for the next day. After returning home from the first session, Michael was found now only hours later, naked, in the middle of the street, covered head to toe in blood. Michael had returned home, to which then his wife and family dog lay dead as the police arrived in the AM. His wife, missing her eyes, tongue, and skin from the front of her skull. The dog, torn limb from limb and spread around the home. He was arrested soon after for the death of his wife. Michael had this to say about his late wife in court, quote, I am released. I am released. It is done. The evil in her has been destroyed. Yeah, that was definitely a vessel. 
for him. He was acquitted on psychological conditions and jury found that he met his breaking point during the exorcism that night. He was acquitted on insanity and remained in and out of facilities until he passed in 2013. Number four, David Berkowitz. New York, 1976, and the police were busy on the search for a man shooting couples in the New York area, which had started to become a citywide phenomenon that summer. Brunette women with long hair frantically cut and dyed their hair blonde in fear. The 44 caliber killer was the title the press gave David in his earliest of assaults. After losing his job, David began to experience psychotic episodes and claimed that his neighbor's German Shepherd had begun talking to him and eventually explained to David that he was a demon. He took the name after the pet's owner, Sam. It was this dog who ordered the killings by David and claims that the pet coaxed David into killing. David used this summer to shoot eight people, resulting in six lives and the stabbings of two others. Using his 44 caliber bulldog revolver, Revolver, David sent police on a wild goose chase around New York City with handwritten letters, David mocking the detectives with cryptic messages. Some of them explain who Sam is and some of them explain what Sam does. Some mock police saying that they are never going to find or stop him. David was finally arrested just hours before his next planned victim's visit. He applauded police in their ability to stop him in the back seat of the car, laughing and cheering. Although David pleaded not guilty to insanity and pleaded guilty, expressing that he was coaxed by the demon and that it demanded him to kill for hell. He was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences with parole after 25 years. During the mid 90s, he amended his confession and claimed that he had been a member of a violent satanic cult that orchestrated the incidents as a ritual murder and pleaded guilty to stabbing and attempting to murder others before the shootings had even begun. His letters are public and spine chilling. Check them out. Real Riddler stuff. Quote, I am the monster. I am Beelzebub. I am the chubby behemoth. Police, let me haunt you with this. I'll be back. I'll be back. Yours in murder, Mr. Monster. Okay, his violent spree led the legal system to create a new law called Son of Sam's Law, designed to create criminals from financially profiting from the publicity created by their crimes, which at the time, he was basically a celebrity. He remains in prison to this day. Number three, Herbert Mullen. 1970s again. At the exact same time, in the same area, police had two serial killers to keep up with, Herbert Mullen and Edmund Kemper. No relationship to each other or each other's cases. Mullen was a paranoid schizophrenic in and out of mental health facilities in California during his teens. Mullen then kills 14 people during a four month period due to quote, the impending natural disaster that would happen if he didn't. Mullen was convinced that the voice in his head he was hearing was telepathic. Mullen claims the voice of the father had explained that the Vietnam War acted as a giant sacrifice that saved us from an earthquake and another one was coming soon. Constantly hearing the man's voice named the father, encouraging him to gain more blood sacrifices, Mullen bludgeoned a man to death with a baseball bat. Mullen claims that the man was actually Jonah from the Bible and was begging him to sacrifice himself to Mullen. He then murdered a woman in the front seat of his car before dismembering her in a nearby park. Yeah, this is real satanic stuff, I told you. His third victim, a priest that he was confessing to in a Catholic church. Mullen says the priest claims to have telepathically begged him to sacrifice his life for the cause. Mullen then killed five people in one day. He claims that all the victims telepathically begged to be sacrificed as a good deed to the father. Herbert Mullen remains in custody. And who was the father who kept talking to him through all of these people? Number two, Richard Ramirez. This next guy is really nasty and deserves to be in the second spot. 13 counts of murder, five attempted murders, 11 assault, and 14 burglaries. Sounds like a hell of a guy. The Night Stalker. Charming name for what this man did. Born in Texas, his older brother went to Vietnam and returned with some pretty gruesome stories and some pretty gruesome visuals. The young Ramirez soaking all of this up grows up obsessed with the satanic occult and fascinated. He made various references to Satan during his legal proceedings. His trial began in 1989 and he was convicted of 13 murders and a variety of other crimes. Nearly two months later, he was sentenced to death with a judge stating that his crimes showed quote, cruelty, callousness, and viciousness beyond any human understanding. And the worst part was that he made most of his victims pray to Satan and swear on Satan that they were gonna tell him the truth, whatever he asked. I'm not really gonna get into the sick details of really what this man did, nor will I with the number one spot, but it involved hammers, machetes, ropes, knives, guns, you name it, anything violent. He was an absolute nasty creature that liked to torture his victims and really drive the satanic love for you know who. First responders would have taken pictures of numerous satanic symbols drawn on the walls in almost a ritualistic reenactment. He was captured by the use of the huge media surrounding his story on the way 
to take his next victim's life. His trial was truly a disgusting display of media attention, one of the most expensive court cases to date, losing only to O.J. Simpson. He screamed Hail Satan at his hearing and flashed self-harm pentagrams. He died of cancer in 2013. This guy must have signed some sort of book for you know who. Coming in at number one, Charles Manson. Okay, so most of us are all familiar with this man and his famous case amongst American pop culture. Ramirez was said to have been a copycat of this man, and I can see why with all the satanicness. California in the late 1960s, a criminal, musician, and a victim of LSD studies, Charles Manson would go on to start and lead the Manson family cult. A small religious group with unclear motives, but lost souls and a ton of drugs, and a father to now a family. In summer 1969, some of the cult members committed murders in LA. Apparently Manson had ordered his followers to kill the people who had lived at the address he had given them for their initiation. The murder of actress Sharon Tate and four others in her home on August 8th and 9th, including the La Biancas the next day. Another two victims. Four members of the family committed the murders under Manson's instructions and satanic offering. Manson apparently heard voices that there was going to be a race war brought on by religious disputes and that these killings were an offering to who exactly? The famous Helter Skelter message, incoherent scribbles, blood all over the walls. They were then to hide underground in quote, the bottomless pit under Death Valley, which Manson knew the location of, but instead were caught on the run days later. Manson was sentenced to life in prison under the pretense that he was the one who targeted, planned, and brainwashed his quote, piggies into committing. While in prison, Charles was diagnosed with schizophrenia and paranoid delusion disorders, seeing visions and hearing voices for more than half of his life. He died in prison in 2017. Yeah, I've seen what Tarantino did with his latest movie and it's definitely a subtle PG-13 fiction version of what actually went down on that night. What do you guys think? Do you think Charles saw the devil? I think he actually was the devil. Starting off this countdown, we have John Reed. John Reed was one of the seven witches tried in 1697 Scotland. When he was caught, persecutors found that he had a mark on his loin. John said that the devil had nipped him there and that it indeed was a witch's mark. John also confessed that he was was in service with the devil. The devil promised him wealth and abundance, but in return, John belonged to the devil. But John revealed that the devil broke his promise and never did anything he said he was going to do. On top of that, John admitted to attending a number of meetings with other witches. He also admitted that he was responsible for the torment of Christian Shaw. Christian was an 11 year old who claimed she encountered a pack of witches who then bullied her and stole her milk. He also admitted that they all drowned her in the local well. As a result of his confession, it was very clear that he was a witch and he was locked away in a cell. The next day though, he was found dead. He had hung himself in his cell with his own scarf. It was believed that this was the devil's work. The devil convinced him to take his own life because John exposed him. Within the following weeks, the other witches close to John took their own lives in their cell as well. Again, it's thought that the devil possessed them and killed them off one by one because he was pissed with them. In our fourth spot, we have Janet Howitt. Between in 1661 to 1663, 44 people in Fofor, Scotland were accused of witchcraft. Seven of those accused were executed. The fate of some of the others remain unclear. One of the main women was Helen Guthrie. She was not a nice lady at all. This woman murdered her own stepsister and the stepsister's children. But she was like, wait, 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 I'll help you, and claimed that she was able to identify other witches just by looking at them. So she said she would help them in the witch hunt if they went easy on her. She then went on to make up elaborate stories of witches meeting up at graves and eating the flesh of other humans, etc. The more she made up and pointed fingers, the longer she got to live. And same with her daughter, Janet Howitt. Janet was also accused of being a witch like her mom. In fact, she had a witch's mark on her shoulder. She said it was from the devil biting it. She also said that it hurt for so long until the devil visited her again and stroked her shoulder. When he did that, the pain immediately stopped. Now Janet was imprisoned with the rest of the accused, but we don't know what happened to her. They held a trial for her and no one testified against her. Plus they only had the mark on her shoulder as evidence. We truly don't know if young Janet was let go or sadly killed. What we do know is that her plea date was 1666, four years after her arrest. So she was in jail for quite some time. In our third spot we have the Witches of Huntingdon. The Witches of Huntingdon were several individuals in the UK who were found guilty of witchcraft. First we have Elizabeth Weed. Apparently one night, three spirits came to her and told her to renounce God and make a blood pact with the devil. So she listened and that's what she did. 
John Winnick also did the same, but only agreed to if the spirits would help him out financially. Others, including John Clark Jr., were also visited by these spirits and decided to also renounce God and make a deal with the devil. Out of the nine people accused, five were found guilty and hanged. Well, John Clark knew that they were going to search everyone's body for their witch's mark, which they all had. So what did he do? He cut off his three days before he was searched. Literally gouged it out of his skin so that the mark was gone. But I'm kind of confused because wouldn't that create another mark? I don't know. But I think he was let off the hook while he watched his friends be killed. He literally said, and I quote, It was foolish to let the authorities find their marks. I cut off mine three days before I was searched. He then denied ever making a pact with the devil or being a witch, even though he was. Moving on to number two, we have George Jacobs Sr. George Jacobs Sr. was an English colonist who was accused of witchcraft in 1692 during the Salem witch trials. George was quite the man around town. He had several run ins with the law. He was known for having a violent temper, and in 1677 hit a man named John Tompkins Jr. Two witnesses said, and I quote, One blow, and if the latter had not held him by the arms, he would have struck him some more, he being in such a passion. Now he was fine for this. Then in 1674, he was sued by his neighbor after he chased some of his horses into the river where they drowned. He argued that the horses were trespassing on his property, whereas others thought he just liked wreaking havoc on town. Fast forward several years later, George Jacobs Sr. and his son, George Jacobs Jr. and his daughter-in-law and granddaughter were all accused of witchcraft. Everyone got off except for Jacobs Sr. and that's because he had a witch's mark. His body was searched and they found what was described as three teats on Jacobs. It was thought that if a person had an extra nipple, that this was a sign that they were a witch. Why? Well, it was believed that the extra nipple or teat was from when the devil or some demons sucked the witch's blood as a form of nourishment. It was said that Jacob Sr. had three of them. One in his mouth, one on his right shoulder blade, and one on his hip. Now, they weren't actually nipples though, it was just a quarter inch long fleshy thing protruding from his skin with a sharp point. They proceeded to stick pins in each of them to see what would happen. This was called the witch pricker. Apparently, if you are pricked and you don't have a reaction to getting pricked and you don't bleed, then you are a witch. Well, when they pricked each teeth, Jacobs never reacted to it and he didn't even bleed. So he was found guilty in August 5th, 1692 and was sentenced to be hanged along with the other witches. And in our number one spot we have Elspeth Rioch. Elspeth Rioch was an alleged witch in Scotland during the early 1600s. When she was 12 years old, she claimed that she was approached by two men. One was dressed in all black, the other in green tartan. The man in green told her that if she followed his instructions, that she would be able to obtain magical powers. He told her to boil an egg and use the condensation from cooking the egg and take it and rub it on her eyes with unwashed hands. Sounds like an eye infection to me. He said that this would give her the powers to see and know everything that she wanted. So she followed his instructions and bam, it actually worked. So now I kind of want to go home and try it. I don't know, maybe it will work. And she actually developed clairvoyant skills. When Elspeth was older, she was visited again by the men. This time it was only the man in black. He showed up in her room one night. He told her that he was neither dead nor alive, but trapped between heaven and earth. He also told her that to maintain her magic skills, she needed to act dumb. That way, no one would suspect a thing. They'd be like, she's not a witch. No, she's way too dumb to be one. Well, eventually she was caught. In fact, she got in way more trouble because of her acting dumb. They were all like, she's fully a witch. She tried to trick us. Let's kill her. At her trial in March of 1616, she confessed to using her clairvoyant powers to spy on people, and she would also use magical spells to cure illnesses. Furthermore, when they inspected her body, they found a witch's mark. She had what appeared to be a scar in the shape of bite marks on her shoulder. Later, she confessed that she was bit by the devil and that was the mark that he left. She was charged with witchcraft and deceiving locals by pretending she was mute. In the end, she was executed by strangulation before having her body burned. Number five, Robert Liston. I figured I'd start with Robert Liston since he's a bit of an outlier on this list. Because unlike the other ones, I don't know if he was truly evil, but he just enjoyed life much differently than the rest of us. You see, Robert Liston was a Scottish surgeon in the 19th century. He had a pretty notable reputation. 
He was the fastest blade in the West End. He boasted that no one could slice and dice faster than he could if the legends about him are to be believed. He was allegedly able to perform a full amputation of a limb in three minutes, only losing one out of every ten patients, which honestly, all things considered, is actually a pretty impressive feat, if not an absolutely terrifying one to think about. Liston didn't really have bedside manner to speak of though, and he would take a glee in his work that kind of bordered on sadism. He wasn't a mad scientist plotting world domination, but he was a particularly odd fellow who really reveled in how good he was at removing people's limbs. Everybody's got a hobby, everybody's got something that makes them happy. One particularly grisly anecdote says he once severed a leg in under 30 seconds and gleefully laughed to his crowd of spectators, TIME ME BOYS! So evil? I don't know, maybe not. Questionable? Absolutely. Would I hang out with this guy? Probably not while he was working. The issue with Liston is that while he definitely had speed, and no one could argue that, accuracy was not always his strongest suit. Frequently his rush work would result in his patients having unnecessary complications and a condition such as dying. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Liston has the world's only surgery with a 300% mortality rate. In one occasion, he was working so quickly and carelessly that he amputated his assistant's own fingers off while attempting to sever a leg. And as he was doing this, he swung the knife backwards and ended up hitting a spectator who fainted out of shock. The patient, the assistant, and the spectator all died a few days later, leading to the only surgery that managed to lead to the death of three people. That's... That's an impressive record, if nothing else. And my friends, if you'd like to hear more freaky stories, true crime, cryptid sightings, UFO conspiracies, and just about everything scary under the sun and above it, why don't you give Top 5 Scary a subscribe for the best scary content on the net and keep on screaming. All right, moving on. Number four, Jose Delgado. Do you think you could control a bull? I definitely don't, but Jose Delgado believed he could. He was a controversial researcher who believed that the best way to get an animal to behave was not by training it or teaching it a trick and giving it a treat every time it does the trick right, but to implant a series of electrodes into an animal's brain to be able to manually control it with a series of electroshocks. To make a lot of very complicated neuroscience comically short in layman's terms, he was creating remote control monkeys. and. Do you kind of want one now? Because I kind of want one. Delgado signed on to Yale University sometime in the 1950s, where he set up his little shop in a lab tinkering with all sorts of fun electronic experiments and gizmos to research new methods of control. Oftentimes, it was literally the flip of a switch that would alter the mood of a creature. The thing is, as scary as what he did, the results he was getting were unbelievable, stuff straight out of sci-fi. He was able to train monkeys by stimulating the parts of their brain that would activate aggression, and he would teach them how to manipulate other monkeys that were threatening them by flipping the switches of their aggression. It's, it's nuts. Did you watch Westworld? I know you probably watched the first season at least, I've seen the viewership numbers. You know how in that show they could use those little tablets to open up like a cowboy robot's personality and alter all of those stats like aggression, romance, bravery, etc, etc. Well that's kind of what Delgado was doing only on chimps instead of Evan Rachel Wood. One controversial experiment involved generating a painful sensation in a chimp's brain every time it produced a particular brain signal, which eventually led to the chimp learning not to think like that. Woof. Delgado's most infamous trial though was the one I mentioned at the beginning, stopping a bull in its tracks. He stood in front of a bull and like the matadors of legend, stared it down and used a shortwave radio and a series of electrodes to freeze it in place. Johnny Knoxville would have loved that. Now despite the controversial nature of his work, which inspired quite a good amount of debate and discussion about ethics, Delgado maintained up until his dying day that the work he was doing was for the benefit of mankind. He wasn't trying to develop mind control control, nor did he see his experiments as a way to influence people, but rather he saw his work as a way to overcome mental illness eventually, and cure brain disorders, and also probably save the lives of a lot of bullfighters. Number 3, Giovanni Aldini. So I don't want to spoil too much about this guy right away, but all I'll say is that Giovanni Aldini would end up being the source of inspiration for the character of Victor Frankenstein from Mary Shelley's famous sci-fi novel. So you can 
probably sort of guess what kind of things this guy was gonna get up to without even having to listen to the next two minutes, but I'm sure you're very curious, so I'll explain it to you in great detail anyway. As a young boy, Giovanni was fascinated by his uncle, who was also a physician, and would watch him perform strange experiments. His uncle had an interest in reanimating the dead to see if it was possible to restore vigor to an animal that had passed, and he primarily tested on frogs, where he would attach electrical currents to them. These events, unsurprisingly, would very profoundly affect Giovanni, who sought out to recreate what his uncle had started only on a much, much bigger target. It's man, it's man if you couldn't figure that out by now. As he grew older, Giovanni followed in his uncle's footsteps, zapping frog corpses, moving up to trying to reanimate a bull's head, until ultimately earning his place in mad science history when he started to begin his trials on humans. He sourced his bodies from executed prisoners, thinking, hey, they're done with them, I might as well use them. Trouble was that Italy tended to prefer execution methods that involved the head and the body going in separate directions, although Giovanni made use of this as well. He discovered that with an electric current, he could make a patient's face contort, and this was on a head detached from a body. There's a terrifying mental image for you for the day. It was then, when he started sourcing prisoners' bodies from England, that he started to inch closer and closer to that goal of reanimation. He asked for a body as fresh as possible, and he got one George Foster. Not the one who played for the Reds, though. Attaching probes to this body, astoundingly, he got the man to open an eye, shake his jaw, and seemingly take a breath. This would end up being his last experiment, however, and he deemed the experiment a failure because the thing didn't sprung the life Frankenstein style. Chin up! I bet you'd love to know that your legacy was inspiring one of the most famous horror stories ever about a lunatic doctor who electrifies a corpse. Number 2. Albert Krigman Now I feel like it bears mentioning, before I even talk about all the twisted weird stuff that he did to earn his place in this list of evil scientists, that Krigman just sounds like an evil scientist name, does it not? Like if you were writing a movie script, Krigman would be the stand-in name for your evil scientist before you could come up with a better one. Anyway, I digress. Dr. Albert Krigman was a dermatologist who was commissioned by Dow Jones and the US Army to research the effects of chemical compounds on human skin. Oh, yep, this is not going anywhere good. It goes without saying, but like he wasn't checking for head and shoulders 3 in 1 conditioner. Krigman was offered a modest lump sum of 10 grand in grant money to research, and he set up shop right away in Holmesburg Prison in Philadelphia, where he got a near endless supply of test subjects or victims to experiment on with very little regard for their safety or hygiene. It was documented that the experiments at Holmesburg Prison included hair transplants, implementation of foreign bodies, burns and radiation of the skin, exposure to dioxin, application and ingestion of toxic and near lethal doses of acne medicine, and the yanking of fingernails. Blech. I completely understand if you need a moment to just kind of catch yourself in editors. I'm so sorry for the pictures you guys are looking at from this video. You guys work hard. Alright, let's get back to talking about stomach churning evil done in the name of science. One of the main compounds Krigman research that I listed off in that little uh, list before was dioxin, the main ingredient of Agent Orange, the infamously evil chemical weapon the USA used during the Vietnam War. Inmates would be scarred, left sick with permanently disfiguring skin conditions leading to very painful side effects. Oftentimes too, many subjects were exposed to all sorts of contaminants and other infections from other conditions he was doing, other experiments he was doing. He did not keep a clean workspace. Krigman destroyed many of the notes from his research, but through testaments from his victims, we know the truth of what he got up to. While there were attempts to get justice after the fact for what the inmates experienced, Krigman himself lived to the age of 93 and never faced any sort of consequences whatsoever for his actions. In fact, the worst part is Krigman loved what he did. Take a listen to this spine-chilling real quote from a real scientist who was really hired by the US Army. All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. That sounds like it's from one of the Saw movies. Are you kidding me? Okay, moving on. Somehow there's a guy who tops this. And finally, number one, Sidney Gottlieb. Unlike the other scientists on this list, where I would offer a little bit of leeway onto whether or not you could truly consider them to be vile and evil outright, or just, you know, a bit 
morally flexible in the name of progress, I actually feel very decent taking a stance and saying Sidney Gottlieb was pure evil. Gottlieb was an American chemist and spy master who helmed the CIA's infamous MK Ultra program. Surely if you've watched even two videos featuring me, you have heard me yell like a lunatic about the MK Ultra program. The CIA is very real, very well documented, very traceable mind control program that they were very really researching in the 60s and 70s. And this lovely son of a gun was behind most of it. Gottlieb is about as close to the pop culture definition of an evil scientist as you can get. He believed that there was a way to influence the human mind to ensure global domination for the United States. At the height of the Cold War, the CIA believed that China and Russia had advancements in mind control technology and they needed to catch up. Gottlieb was commissioned to run a series of experiments. Initially, the goal was to develop a truth serum. Gottlieb would experiment with just about every single illegal, illicit substance you could on humans, most of the time without them knowing what he was doing. He tested on volunteers, prisoners, homeless, but most often people had no idea the nature of his experiments and he tended to pick people who had nothing left and had a lot to gain. After months and months of this left him unsatisfied, he was granted extra powers and resources for his experiments, gaining the full funding of the US Army. The goal of MK Ultra was to develop techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit anything. Wow. This included torment like electroshock, sensory and sleep deprivation, all kinds of illicit substances, physical and mental damage, and so much more we can't even talk about. Eventually the program was officially disbanded, citing that it was difficult to control the human psyche in this way. Gottlieb would stick around however since he had a real taste for doing evil science and would helm the CIA's poison research division, looking into just about every way you could conceivably poison a human being, including one infamous poison cigar for one Fidel Castro. Gottlieb retired in relative obscurity, never seeing any justice for his work, and lived out his days quietly in Virginia, largely forgotten by history. Well, not by me. Sorry, if you're the real life inspiration for Papa on Stranger Things, you're gonna be the number one evil scientist on this list. Number five, Julie Brown. Our first witch today on the list of which witch is which is Julie Brown, legendary voodoo priestess of the swamps. New Orleans is filled to bursting with two things, the most wondrous advancements in soul food and gumbo technology on the planet and ghost stories. There's a whole lot of voodoo to go around in Louisiana and in Manchac they say there's the ghost of an old voodoo priestess named Julie Brown. The story of Julie Brown is an unnerving one. I would certainly hope so, otherwise it wouldn't be on this list. She was said to be reclusive, would sit on the porch of her swamp shack and spend the day cackling, predicting the demise of nearby towns and its residents, singing twisted songs about her death and the apocalypse and the end of days. Despite the fact that she was a kooky old lady singing songs about the apocalypse on her front steps, locals actually feared her and treated her as an oracle and a prophet and were very nervous of wronging her just in case she placed a hex on them, which, you know, is reasonable. You should always treat everyone you meet with kindness just in case they turn out to be a witch who can hex you. The prediction she's most known for, besides one bizarre correct prediction about the 1994 Super Bowl Cowboys at Bills game, was her threatening prediction in 1915, where Julie Brown would cackle over and over and over that she was going to die and take everyone with her. She chanted this again and again, until her death. On her funeral, a hurricane hit the town, decimating three villages and taking countless lives. Julie is said to be buried in the swamp, and locals believe it was her spirit that caused the hurricane. And if you happen to be passing through Manchac, just pay your respects to Miss Julie Brown. Like I said, you never know what kind of secret somebody has. And if you're looking for more stories about witches or really any kind of urban legend, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. I'm not kidding. If you can think it up, there's pretty good odds we've done two to three videos on it. We got something scary for everything under the sun and above it. So hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a single scream, but do that after this video because I got four more witch stories coming up for you right now. And wouldn't you know it, the next one's about a bell. Number four, the Bell Witch. In the 1800s, a farmer going by the name of John Bell moved his family to picturesque Adams, Tennessee, onto a beautiful 300 acre farm, little slice of American pie. 
Bell quickly became a figurehead of the community, respected by many, and became a local leader at the town church. For the Bell family, things were the brightest they've ever been. They were living the dream and ringing in good fortune. I was trying to make a Bell pun work there. There's probably a better one. Things wouldn't be good for long, and they'd find themselves in a nightmare shortly. By 1817, strange, inexplicable things started to occur all around the farmstead. John Bell found a strange animal on the farmstead, a mutant hybrid that resembled a grotesque mix between a dog and a rabbit. I know that sounds like it would be cute, but I think if you get the wrong parts of both, that's just gonna turn out to be a very, very ugly animal. I think dog, rabbit ears, pretty cute. Maybe like dog, rabbit face, dog, rabbit body. I don't know, mess. Anyway, it was a disgusting thing. The younger members of the Bell family would wake up covered in red scratches all over their bodies. At all hours of the day, the family would hear faint whispering and singing that sounded like an old woman singing hymns. Most tragic is the Bells found a mysterious vial of liquid inside their home that no one could explain or understand. Nervous about what it was, the Bells offered the mystery liquid to their cat, which passed almost immediately. Rest in peace, Bell Cat, taken too soon, undeservedly. You didn't deserve to be an experiment for them. For three long years, the Bell family was tormented by a mysterious entity that would later become known as the Bell Witch, after the mysterious old woman's humming and singing. In 1820, John Bell quickly grew extremely ill, quickly descending in his health, and would pass away later. At his funeral, the mourners complained they could all hear the laughing of an old woman mocking and singing the fate of the late John Bell. The farm became a haunted attraction, where it still is to this day, and it even caught the attention of President Andrew Jackson, who in 1819, a year before Mr. Bell's passing, visited to see if legends of the witch were real. Allegedly. Allegedly. As soon as his carriage arrived at the property, the horses refused to budge anymore. The animals can always tell. Number three, the black hag. Our next witch probably has the most impressive title out of any of them, the black hag. That is such a cool name for a witch to have. She resides in a church called, oh God. <sighs> Let me try this. The Monaster Nagal, oh. What, you wanna throw that on screen for me? Monster Ning, how, how am I supposed to say that? This is the witch's curse. I don't even know about any witchy stuff she does. She tries to get you to say this evil word and then it curses your family. I'm getting a note over here. It says that it's also called the Abbey of the Black Hag. Well, that's, that's what we're going with. We're not calling it that other thing. I'm not doing that. The Black Abbey of the Hag, which as far as I know is the only name this church has ever gone by, was built in 1298. Wow, it's an old church. And was one of the few well-known medieval convents in old Ireland. The remains of the abbey still stand today in a secluded valley, making an already mysterious and supernatural place just that much more atmospheric. The place is called the Abbey of the Black Hag, for God's sakes. You don't name a place that unless it's pretty haunted. Sounds like it's straight out of Dishonored. And while I've got you here, Dishonored 3, when? When's that happening? Now, it's believed that the last abbess, which is a horrible word, in charge of the abbey practiced witchcraft, and in the scary way. She brought death, misfortune to the surrounding areas. Pope Martin V condemned the abbey. He was not down for witches at all. Catholic Church don't play with witches. The accused witch left to live out in the damp, deserted abbey by herself, which she probably loved because that sounds scary. Over time, her skin blackened, her hair furled, and her soul twisted, leading to the place being named the Abbey of the Black Hag. And if you can believe this, there's actually more to this story. The Count and Countess of Desmond once called the Abbey home when attempting to flee their attackers, where the Countess was fatally struck by an arrow and buried by her husband, but it would not be the end of the Countess. Sightings of a ghostly figure around the ruins of the Abbey were common, eventually leading to someone digging up worn out finger bones. And it's said now that a woman's panicked shrieking can be heard in the early hours around the Abbey. Number two, the Blair Witch. Perhaps one of the most pervasive witches in pop culture after the Wicked Witch of the West, the Scourge of Maryland, the Blair Witch. 
Perhaps you saw the very successful 1999 documentary regarding her legend, or maybe you saw one of the two middling sequels. According to legends, she haunts the Black Hills Forest near the town of Burkittsville, Maryland. The local folklore states that in the 18th century, a woman named Ellie Kedward was accused of practicing witchcraft. She was chased and exiled out of the township of Blair and condemned to live in the woods, hence, the Blair Witch. It's believed that she died out in the surrounding forests in the harsh winter of 1785, but it's also said that she placed a curse on the town moments before her death, vowing to seek revenge on the townspeople and their descendants for generations. And not to split hairs here, but that does actually kind of sound like she was a witch. I'm not saying it was justified in exiling a woman out of her town, just that placing a hex on a town definitely sounds like witchcraft and I can understand where they were coming from. I'm just trying to understand the scenario, okay? I'm divorced from it, I'm not part of it, I'm just trying to understand it. From here, the legends of Kedward grew into the larger than life figure, the Blair Witch. Various disturbing events were attributed to the Blair Witch. Mysterious disappearances, people being lured away into the woods, supernatural phenomena, camera crews disappearing in forests, reports of finding strange hex bags in the surrounding woods filled with strange runes and symbols and remnants of people, hair, teeth, for her to perform wicked rituals. Now, it goes without saying, unless you firmly, firmly believed the marketing campaign of the 1999 film, the Blair Witch Project is obviously a movie. While they say it's based on the real story of Ellie Kenward, there is no record of a Blair Township ever having existed. Almost certainly, the Blair Witch's story is inspired in large swaths by the Bell Witch, who we talked about earlier. Although in a kind of unique case, back in the day when the Blair Witch did come out, its marketing was so effective, and in this sort of like pre-early internet area, there were several people who did think it was real. It was a cast of completely unknown actors by a team no one had ever heard of. And on some level, I don't know, maybe to get esoteric with it, what makes an urban legend real? Just us believing in it, right? Do you believe the other four stories I've told you more? They're no less fictional. My only source was the internet for all of those. So, I'm just saying, open mind. Number 1. La Bruja de Cachiche And our final witch for today is going to be La Bruja de Cachiche, a well-known urban legend from Peru, specifically from the coastal town of Cachiche near the city of Ica. The legend revolves around a reputed witch who lived during the colonial era. According to legend, La Bruja de Cachiche was an enigmatic woman with exceptional powers and knowledge of witchcraft. She was believed to possess both healing abilities and the abilities to cast curses. She multi specked It was said that she used various herbs, potions, and rituals to perform her magic. Now, one of the most interesting aspects of this legend is this belief that La Bruja de Cachiche had a physical deformity, specifically a hunchback. And if there's one thing we love in an urban legend, it's a bit of a physical deformity. It makes it that much more believable and scary. Because someone conventionally unattractive is way scarier than not. Don't blame me. Blame our Western views on beauty. I didn't write them. I just perpetuate them. Over time, the legend of La Brahuda de Cachiche became intertwined with the history and culture of the town of Cachiche. Local residents and visitors began associating certain landmarks and natural phenomena with their presence. For example, there's a famous gnarled and twisted tree called the Witch's Tree that is said to have been her gathering place. Today, Kashish has embraced the legend of La Brahuja de Kashish as part of its heritage. The town has a statue of the witch and there are various festivals and events dedicated to her and I guarantee you no party goes even half as hard as a party celebrating a local witch. Oh my god, imagine the cauldrons do. The legend has also become a popular tourist attraction, drawing visitors who are interested in the occult Folklore and statues. Number five, Jose Delgado, the mad mind controller. One of the more common mad scientist tropes is the desire to develop devices or formulas that will allow the scientist to control people's minds. The idea of so completely and irreversibly being under someone's control sounds so outlandish that many would be forgiven for writing such stories off as pure science fiction. However, not only have scientists made several attempts at this over the years, one made a frightening amount of progress. Enter Dr. Jose Manuel 
Rodriguez Delgado, who was one such scientist. Delgado spent years constructing a device that he called the Stimuceiver, which was designed to allow him to control the minds of both animals and men. While doing research at Yale University, Delgado inserted electrode implants into the skulls and brains of several primates. He then used a remote controlled device which paired with the implants and stimulated them with electricity, allowing him to force the primates to perform complicated movements. He also performed this experiment on a bull, who he got into the ring with. When the bull charged him, he used the device to cause the bull to stop at his will. Delgado hooked up 25 people to his device, and though he couldn't make them move how he wanted to, he was able to control the people's aggression levels. This was not enough for Delgado as he wanted to achieve total control, once being quoted as saying, man does not have the right to develop his own mind. This kind of liberal orientation has great appeal. We must electrically control the brain. Someday, armies and generals will be controlled by electric stimulations to the brain. I don't know about you, but wishing to create an army of mind-controlled soldiers is taking it too far. Number 4. The Real Frankenstein In 1816, Mary Shelley, her lover Percy, her sister Claire, and her lover Lord Byron were having a competition to see who could tell the best scary story. The 18-year-old Shelley won the competition with her story, which she wrote down and anonymously published two years later, under the title Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus thus creating the genre of science fiction. Dr. Frankenstein and his creature would of course become icons of pop culture that are discussed to this very day. But what inspired the young writer to come up with her famous mad scientist? Three figures come up a lot when this question is asked, making this entry a three for one special. The first and most obvious inspiration was a man named Johann Dippel, who was a scientist trying to crack the art of alchemy. He claimed that he had used alchemy to develop an oil called the elixir of life, which he believed could prevent death or bring the dead back to life. He was tried for heresy after several bizarre experiments on corpses, which he hoped would allow him to transfer souls between them. He lived near Darmstadt, Germany, in a castle that was called Castle Frankenstein. Another possible inspiration was Giovanni Aldini, who was the nephew of a scientist named Luigi Galvani. Aldini spent a large portion of his life defending his uncle's theories that electricity was the vital life force both science and alchemy were searching for. He did this by traveling across Europe and providing demonstrations as he hooked up the dead bodies of animals and the severed body parts of recently executed criminals to batteries and made them move. The convulsions caused by that much electricity traveling through a dead body gave the appearance of reanimation, and he shocked and delighted audiences. The next was a Scottish scientist named Andrew Urey, whose work drew international headlines around the time that Frankenstein was written. He believed that if the phrenic nerve were stimulated by electricity, he could bring the dead back to life, and he resolved to try this on the body of a convicted and executed murderer named Matthew Clydesdale. As he wrote of the experiment, when the supraorbital nerve was excited, every muscle in his countenance was simultaneously thrown into fearful action. Rage, horror, despair, anguish, and ghastly smiles united their hideous expressions in the murderer's face, surpassing far the wildest representations of Fuseli or Akeen. At this period, several of the spectators were forced to leave the apartment from terror or sickness, and one gentleman fainted. Though his experiments were shocking and impressive, they were ultimately failures, and Yuri was forced by the church to immediately stop his work as they were viewed as an affront to God. Instead, he went on to revolutionize the way volumes were measured and made a working thermostat. Number 3. Vladimir Demikhov the Dog Grafter. One of the more recent and disturbing fictional mad scientists to hit the silver screen is the one featured in The Human Centipede, who plans to sew three people together in order to create a new living co-joined creature that all share one digestive system. While explaining this to his victims, the scientist shows photos and refers to a previous experiment where he managed to sew three Rottweilers together. While this is disgusting, it is unfortunately not without precedent in real life. Though the mouth placement was thankfully not the same, it does share some similarities to the work of a real-life Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikhov. 
Vladimir was a pioneer in the field of organ transplantation, and some of his groundbreaking work involved performing the transfer of vital organs between dogs. This was vital for the scientific and medical community's understanding of organ transplants, and has resulted in millions of lives being saved. But the work he moved on to in the 50s is when he took the whole thing too far. He decided that he wanted to take the entire thing further by creating a two-headed dog. He and his assistants attempted the experiment at least 24 times, with the 24th being the one that was most widely publicized, and the closest that anyone could really call a success. The operation took three and a half hours, and by its conclusion, both of the dogs were still able to see, smell, and swallow. Although Shavka had no digestive system, and whatever she ate or drank simply exited her body via a tube that Vladimir had implanted. While one of his previous attempts had apparently survived a whole month, these two dogs mercifully lasted a much shorter amount of time, passing away four days after the surgery due to a nicked vein. Photos of the surgically connected dogs were published in Life magazine, and they are truly ghastly to behold. While this is bizarre, it was also needlessly cruel, as it had little to no scientific benefit, and the scientist had no end goal in mind when he did it, other than wondering if it was possible. Number 2. Fritz Haber Dr. Poison. The German-born chemist Fritz Haber has a somewhat mixed legacy in the scientific community. On the one hand, his invention of the Baber-Bosch process allowed people to use nitrogen and hydrogen gas to synthesize ammonia, which was extremely important for the creation of large-scale fertilization. In fact, this Nobel Prize-winning method is used in one-third of all global food production, which feeds almost 50% of the world's population. Basically, without him, it would be impossible to feed as many of the people of Earth as we do. On the other hand, he was also a fierce German nationalist, and when the First World War broke out, he pioneered the development and usage of chlorine and other poisonous gases, to be used to break the deadlocks the Germans had been experiencing in trench warfare of the First World War. When asked about the moral implications of his work, he was quoted as saying, death is death by whatever means it is inflicted. Someone who felt he had gone too far with his creation was his wife, who after the first use of weaponized chlorine gas in 19 1915, walked into their garden with his old service pistol and ended her own life in protest. As a Jewish man, Haber was forced to resign his post when the Third Reich came to power in 1933, but his work on poison gases was still used by the Germans in the death camps in order to exterminate their prisoners. Fritz Haber changed the world with his first discovery, allowing us to feed millions of people who might otherwise have starved. But due to the prolific work on poison gases, he is more commonly remembered as the father of chemical warfare. Number 1. Shiro Ishii, the Professor of Pain in World War II, Shiro Ishii was a member of Imperial Japan's medical corps who became inspired to pursue truly horrendous methods of germ warfare. Due to his status as an esteemed scientist and general, he was placed in charge of the Japanese government's bio and chemical warfare unit, known as Unit 71, despite the fact that the Geneva Convention had banned such means in 1925. Ishii insisted that the only way that Unit 71 could make meaningful scientific progress was to use civilians as tests subjects. Men and women and children were subjected to Ishii's brutal experiments, which were written off as a necessary which were written off as necessary acts in order to bolster the Japanese army and discover potential weaknesses in their enemies by discovering just how much the human body could handle before collapsing. While some prisoners were purposely infected with diseases before having their organs removed so Ishii could study the effects of the illness on the organs without having to factor in decomposition, others were intentionally given gangrene or frost Bite, and some were vivisected while still alive, while others had limbs amputated and then reattached to the opposite sides. While he was far from the only person conducting cruel and unusual experiments on prisoners during the Second World War, the case could be made that he was the most insane of them. There is little doubt that he went leagues too far, with his methods not even coming close to being justified by their ends. 